Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, hear from both sides on an initiative to legalize recreational marijuana. We'll learn about a new study on the use of police body cameras, and we'll hear from the authors of a new comprehensive Star Wars book. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. The paperwork is in for a proposed ballot measure that would legalize recreational marijuana use in Arizona. Carlos Alfaro is Arizona political director for the Marijuana Policy Project, which supports the initiative. Speaking against is Seth Liebson, chair of Arizonans for Responsible Drug Policy. Good to have you both here. Thank you so much Thank for you. joining us. What exactly does this ballot initiative do? Well, it really does represent a strong majority of Arizonans that uh, believe that marijuana prohibition has been a total failure. It's been as wasteful and counterproductive and inefficient as alcohol prohibition was in the 1930s. And a lot of its advocates and um, organizations that seek to keep marijuana prohibition sound like the people in the 30s. Um, the support for legalization is not surprising. About 69% of all people, and this is from the Pew Research Center, know that marijuana is less harmful than alcohol. About half of Americans have tried it. And uh, more importantly, prohibition has shown not to work. The substance is still out there. It's on our streets. It's in our schools. And we have to come up with a better system to regulate, tax it, and reap the benefits from it. A better system to regulate, tax, and reap benefits. Yeah, I don't think so. And I think uh, you can look at the states that have experimented with this. You can look at the countries that have experimented with this. And you can find the remorse from the Netherlands to England, where they have uh, tried to declassify it down and now are trying to reclassify it up when they've seen the damage. When you look at Colorado and you look at the effect of legalization and what it's done to the teen and adolescent population, expulsions up, treatment admissions up, accidents up. It's nothing Arizona would want. It's nothing I don't think the rest of the country should want. The truth is this. If alcohol is their model, we have to ask what is the situation with alcohol in this country and in this state? We have about 25 percent of adolescents using alcohol illegally underage in this, in this state. Marijuana. If you want that use to look like alcohol, then you'll go with this initiative. The truth is, marijuana is low because it's illegal, and it's and it's illegal because it's dangerous. It's not dangerous because it's illegal. Again, there are those who say that adolescent brains are harmed here. That this leads to other things. That you got uh, people driving while high. All, all these problems. You hear what's going on in Colorado and other places around the world. How do you respond? Well, Colorado has actually been a success. Uh, millions and millions of dollars in revenue. Uh, when you talk about, for example, what Seth talked about with uh, comparing it to alcohol, it is scary when you see the consequences of just marijuana isolated. But when you compare it to alcohol, you'll see that when it comes to addiction, fatalities, uh, violent and reckless behavior, alcohol and marijuana are in completely different leagues. Uh, many, many bodies of medicine have, have shown that uh, marijuana is objectively less harmful than alcohol. And, of course, Colorado has reaped the benefits of it. I think the point, though, would be it, it, less harmful. It can be debated, but let's say it is less harmful. Do you still want that tacked on to the harm that alcohol already does? Oh, no, absolutely not. The, uh, the point is that right now in Arizona, there's millions of dollars in sales of marijuana that are happening in the underground market, that are happening in... in um, profiting cartels and gang members and drug dealers. That could be going to our schools, it could be going to our public health, and it's not going there. Why right not now. regulate this, the tax estimates. this, get sure. the money out of this, get it out of the darkness, up in the light, get the cartels out of here, the whole nine yards. New York Times did a story about two weeks ago showing that the estimates for the money that was coming into Colorado were about 42% off. I would like to ask Carlos what his feasibility study is on what the money he expects to come in from this initiative would be. The truth is the black market has not disappeared in Colorado. About 40% of the marijuana sold in Colorado is still on the black market and you have people from other states now coming into Colorado for marijuana, so Colorado has itself become a black market. The cost is the really interesting question, and you, you're right to ask about it with alcohol because we do take in tax dollars for alcohol in this state. We take in about $70 million a year in taxes on alcohol, but we spend over $130 million a year, taxpayer dollars, not all costs included, just your tax dollars at work, 
in treating the substance abuse that comes from that. It is not a net positive, and I'd like to know from Carlos what money he expects to come in. More importantly, for treatment, what money he expects to I go out. I think that Seth is uh, showing just how out of touch him and his organization uh, really are. When you can go up to any high school or any college students, and they'll tell you that marijuana is very easy to get. It's not like that for alcohol. Um, if we put it behind the counter, if we ask people for ID when they come and buy it, that's a much better system than this prohibition, sticking our heads in the sand and pretending that the problem is going to go away because there's a law in the book is not really how this, this government works or how we should be going about this complex issue. Everyone knows that they can get a beer, they can get a bottle of wine at a gas station at 7 a.m. any day of the week. They can't do that with marijuana. Use sure is low can. in mar No, they can't. And use is lower in, uh, marijuana is use, marijuana use is lower in this state because it is illegal. If you want to see it become uh, more used, then you will make it just like alcohol. That's the problem with their initiative, by the way. If they're so concerned about that, then my question to them about the language in their initiative is, why are the penalties for violating their marijuana law less than the penalties for violating well, about, their alcohol about law. half of the country has tried it and the vast majority of people um, are responsible productive citizens that um, actually enjoy having a little bit of marijuana instead of having a beer after work this shouldn't be a crime this initiative targets uh, responsible adult use and it helps us monitor and oversee uh, sales to minors if the, it, so that we can you know accurately show ID so that we don't Get but in your law, hands. in your law on fake IDs, the penalties for a fake ID with marijuana are far less than the penalties for a fake ID but with alcohol. If I can just it. finish sure. my question, for alcohol, a fake ID gets you thousands of dollars in a fine and jail time. For marijuana, you make it a slap on the wrist of 300 bucks. Now, what does that say to the kids But what in you're Arizona? doing is that you want to keep the same system that doesn't make marijuana disappear, that doesn't make use disappear. Half of the country have tried it. 69% know that it's less harmful. What I and yet you want to keep the same system. If, you really want to, if you're really worried about the children, if you're really worried about people, irresponsible people getting a hold of marijuana, you would ask for ID before they got it. Or you would keep it where it is, where use would be lower than what it would be where it would be legal. My question is this. We're sitting at an ASU campus. Uh, we have just gone through a big debate on funding for education at ASU and schools across the state. We've just finished the season of galas raising funds for all kinds of educational nonprofits in this city and in this state. What's the point? What's the point of the debate of putting money into the education of our youth? What's the point of trying to protect the health of our youth and the minds of our youth and early childhood education and childhood nutrition? If we are going to put into their stream and into their brains a substance that wipes and nullifies all of that. I think this is the reason why most people agree with our position and that is to regulate responsible adult use. There shouldn't be any reason that uh, you as a college student, as an adult over 21, uh, can't after school or after work, come home and have a beer. It would be ridiculous to so for somebody to arrest you for that, to find you and punish you for that. But it's Carlos, just as ridiculous it's already to do regulated. It with you want to legalize it's not it. Regulated. Every parent it's who is watching this, who knows that they're taking a glass of wine with dinner, would be astounded to hear from you that their child should listen to you and hear that marijuana is less dangerous than that class but, of that, wine. That child is at risk of obtaining marijuana more easily under the prohibition, marijuana prohibition that you want to push, I, then regulation and taxation. It's not a statistic that Let's backs fund that public, public education and public health instead of criminalizing I it. I have a very quick question. I want very quick responses. Do you think the way we control and uh, criminalize and try to regulate marijuana now is a success? It's less of a failure than it would be if we legalized it. Their model is alcohol. Stick with that. Alcohol legalization and recreational use of alcohol costs this state billions and the incarceration is so high that for them to make that their model is public policy malfeasance. I need a quick answer from you. Of course. If alcohol is such a problem, why would it make sense to add to that problem marijuana concerns? There is millions of dollars in sale in marijuana today in Arizona. Let's get that those sales away from the cartels and the gang members and more towards public education and public health. Let's Gen regulate and tax it. Got to stop it right there. Good to have you both here. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much. much.
The ASU Center for Violence Prevention and Community Safety is set to conduct a study that measures the response to officer-worn video cameras. Joining us now is the study's principal investigator, Michael White, associate director of the center and a professor of criminology and criminal justice. Welcome to Arizona Horizon. Thank you. Talk to me about this study. What exactly is going to be looked at here? You know, Ted, obviously there's a lot of interest in uh, this technology. Uh, there was interest before Ferguson, Missouri, but certainly since uh, that incident and then, of course, what happened last week, the, uh, the, the focus on this technology has just exploded. Uh, the day after the, the riots in Baltimore, President Obama gave a speech and he, and he talked specifically about body-worn cameras. And then just on Friday, they announced a, a funding program where just this year alone they're going to make $20 million available. So the, that's the background for this study and, and the concern is that you have literally thousands of police departments across the U.S. who are moving in this direction and, and there's virtually no research to, to, to look to to get some ideas about um, how to plan this if you're a chief of police, uh, how to deploy it, and what to expect when officers start wearing the cameras. So that's, that's the background. The, uh, the study that I'm conducting involves two police departments, Tempe, Arizona, and Spokane, Washington. Uh, both are, are very rigorous research designs. We're doing randomized controlled trials, and the funder is the, uh, the Arnold Foundation. And, and the idea is that we will conduct research over the next two years that will begin to answer some of these critical questions about planning, about deployment, and, and impact and consequences. So with that in mind, what exactly will be measured in this study? Certainly, one of the things that we want to do is we want to capture the, the planning an implementation process. So if I'm the chief of police in some small town in Louisiana, uh, I have somewhere to go to look to see what, it, what the elements are of a good planning and implementation process. In terms of the outcomes, we have a range of different outcomes that we're looking at. We're certainly interested in officer perceptions. What do, what do officers think about this technology? Do they think it's going to make their jobs easier, more difficult? So we're going to be surveying officers uh, over uh, really several different occasions to see, if their to see what their attitudes are originally and then to see if their attitudes change. What about citizens? What about suspects? What about victims? Exactly. So uh, the second piece is we will be contacting uh, individuals who have interactions with police officers who are wearing cameras or not, depending on which, uh, which group of officers uh, we look at. And we're going to be asking citizens what they thought of the encounter. Did they realize that they were being recorded? And if they did, what did they think about that? Uh, did, did they feel uh, did they feel good about the fact that it was that the encounter was recorded or did it aggravate them and if so why? So certainly we're interested in the perceptions of, of both of the individuals that are involved in a police citizen encounter and uh, one of the one of the, um, the real questions about this technology is whether or not it affects behavior. There was one study that was, uh, that was done in, in California, and after the officers in that department started wearing body-worn cameras, uh, citizen complaints dropped by nearly 90 percent, use of force dropped by 60 percent, and there's a, um, a belief that when officers start wearing cameras, it has this, uh, what I call a civilizing effect. That is, it changes behavior for the better. The, the belligerent and rude citizen becomes much more compliant and respectful, and you see the same types of behavior among the police officers. So we certainly want to look at that and see if, if, we, can, uh, if we can replicate those findings from that study. Does the citizen know that there that, that are cameras? I mean, how are these cameras worn? Sometimes you can get cameras so small no one even knows they're there. Right, so the, you know, the cameras vary in size uh, and, and certainly the departments also vary a little bit in terms of whether they let citizens know. So for example, in Spokane, Washington, where I'm, uh, I'm conducting the, the study, uh, they are required to notify the citizen that the recording uh, is occurring. Interesting. Uh, in, in Arizona, there's no legal requirement for notification. However, if a citizen says, hey, are you recording me? Then, then the officer has to acknowledge that that's happening. But there's not a requirement. I just out of curiosity, why Tempe and Spokane? Was, was, what's going on there? Well, there's, a, there's been a lot of interest uh, in body-worn cameras here in this area. And uh, Phoenix has had a study, Mesa as well. Uh, I had started a conversation with, uh, with the leadership at the Tempe Police Department before uh, I was contacted for this funding opportunity. So that was why I selected Tempe and then Spokane. Uh, similar reasons. The chief was, was very interested in the technology there. We met at a, a conference 
and he was very interested in partnering uh, to conduct some research. I would imagine police chiefs and departments, uh, uh, transparency is obviously a major goal on all sides, I would imagine. Um, but for the police departments, just how you work around this, how this is included in your daily patrolling activities, that's got to be a major factor. It is, and I think, I think you're right, Ted. I think one of the reasons that police chiefs across the country are embracing this, this technology is it, it represents an opportunity for the chief of police to, to ex ex extend an olive branch, if you will, to the community, to the minority community in particular, and to say, we've got nothing to hide, we're embracing this technology, we will be transparent. And that, you know, buying cameras and putting them on officers is, is the easy part. What happens afterward is, is much more difficult, much more complex. And that's why uh, there's a need for research to, to kind of document all the issues that need to be thought about up front as you're making the decision to deploy the technology. And will these be live streaming? Are these the kinds of things that record somewhere? How, how does that work? Yeah, generally, uh, once you hit the record button, and, and most departments have a policy where they only record uh, law enforcement contacts. So they're, they're not running uh, you know, constantly during a shift. Right. Uh, whenever an officer responds to a call for service or maybe proactively stops a citizen, that's when they would activate the camera. And then uh, it records until you, uh, you know, until you turn the camera off. And then uh, at the end of the shift, the officer then can uh, download the video from the device onto okay. a storage system. So it doesn't go back to a central headquarters. It's got to be literally taken back after the recording. This is a one-year study, correct? Will, this, you be, will you be able to kind of look at progress throughout the year? So, yeah, in Spokane, uh, they started wearing cameras actually on Saturday. So uh, just because of where the departments were when I began the study, Spokane's a few months ahead, ahead of schedule. Tempe is still in the process of reviewing uh, the, the bids that were uh, that were uh, you know, selected in terms of the, mm -hmm. the RFP. And, and so they're trying to select their vendor. And it looks like about August or so, they'll have their officers beginning to wear the cameras. All right, very good. Good to have you here. Thanks for joining okay. us. Thank you. Today is Star Wars Day. The designation is derived from a pun based on the date. May the 4th be with you. Coinciding with Star Wars Day is the release of the Ultimate Star Wars Book, an in-depth visual publication exploring Star Wars characters and storylines. Here now are the authors of the two, uh, the two authors, I should say, of the book, Adam Bray, and also joining us, Tricia Barr. Good to have you both here. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for All right, why this book? Why now? Well, now is a great time. Um, you might have heard there, there's a, a new movie coming uh, towards the end of the year. Um, and uh, with that, it's, it's a great time for uh, new and old fans to re-engage uh, the Star Wars franchise. And so this book, um, it takes into account the entire film saga of all six movies and the two animated series, um, The Clone Wars and Star Wars Rebels and lays out a foundation work, uh, a foundation to start with uh, as we look forward to what's coming ahead. I was going to say, what does this add to the vast Star Wars canon? It's not adding, it's compiling it and putting this great visual presentation so you can just literally go in the order of watching and chron chronologically and look and discover who the characters were, who they were in to Star Wars, Luke Skywalker, Princess Leia, or even a character like Greedo, 
who's in the movie for just briefly, but he's in the Clone Wars, so you could say, hey, I want to go find out more about him. Yeah, and obviously the big stars, 3CPO and the others, we're looking at some of the design here. Uh, what I like about this is it's, it's visual, but you don't scrim on the words either. I mean, you guys make sure that a lot is said there, and that I think, that's, I think this particular audience would find that very important. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, some of the entries are, are quite lengthy, and it, it really goes into the characters and the locations uh, and the technology and goes really, really in depth. I think a, a lot of uh, fans may not realize who are just familiar with the movies that something like uh, the Clone Wars TV series, that uh, was six plus seasons. So there's an incredible amount of material, uh, which is all considered, you know, canon part of the story, and you can, you can get up to date on all of that in this book. Well, how, how did you research that? I mean, this must have been just, I mean, is it easy or is it difficult? It's not difficult to do something that you love. Right. But it was a lot of work. There were late nights watching mm. the movies specifically to, you know, get the information, watching the Clone Wars. That was one of the areas I covered. So, you know, six seasons, that's a good volume of work to go in and figure out everything that happened, all the vehicles, the locations, and why they matter in Star Wars. So, yeah, be because you can't really like, put something in the book mm. and you find out later that just because a couple of other books or magazines said X, it was really Y. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, I, I watched, uh, you know, segments of different movies and I went back and I realized, oh, gosh, I've seen this, you know, dozens of times, but I never actually understood this point here. I never understood that George Lucas was making a parallel of something, you know, in the original trilogy. He's making parallel scenes uh, in, in the, the newer prequels, and there, there's a lot of recurring themes that uh, had just gone in one ear and out the other. Are the recurring themes noted in the text? Yes, yeah. Very interesting. So when you, when you were doing this, did you did you learn something? Did something? Do you think something was this way, but it was really that way? I had a better appreciation of Luke Skywalker's uh, journey as a hero. We tend to think of him as a conquering hero, but really his final heroic act that we saw in the movies was him laying down his lightsaber and choosing mm -hmm. to not fight his father. And you know, I sort of found that and remembered it and reminded, you know, because you see it as a kid and you think one thing and right. then you really look at it as a holistic thing and what they've done with all the movies and then you see where Luke Skywalker really is as a hero. When you were writing this, putting this together, did you think that your audience was the, the neophyte fan, the dedicated fan, somewhere in the middle? Well, I've used resource books for as long as I can remember to, you know, write my own stories and just to enjoy the movies and the TV shows. So I used the resource books. So I was thinking of those type of fans. But this was also I was thinking along a new fan who would come in and really just want to start diving in. This is where you start. This is people who are working on Star Wars are going to this resource now already. To, Interesting. Yes. It's the same thing for you, because I know it's often when, when writers write, mm -hmm. they, they, they see someone out there, they have, they have a vague idea of who they're writing for. Who are you writing for? Really everyone. Um, the, the great thing about this book is it's laid out chronologically. So um, you can, uh, as you watch you know, the movies in order, you can follow along in the book and uh, meet the characters in the book as you see them on screen. Uh, so you can learn about them as you go. I got, I got to ask, how did you get involved in this? This is obviously a major part of your life. What, what right. got you started? Um, well, I, I first fell in love with Star Wars when I was about three years old. I, I, I still remember seeing, um, you know, the fuzzy memories, but I remember seeing it at a drive-in movie theater with my parents. And uh, my very first birthday that I remember, you know, was a Millennium Falcon and, and the first run of Star Wars action figures. So oh my goodness. It's, it's a live stream to be able to work on this. What about you? What got you into all this? My grandparents took me to see Star Wars in 1977. And so it was a family event. And I have sort of stayed in it for the family of fans that we have. And mm -hmm. I've never, I've always loved Star Wars. This has been a passion. Do you still love it for the way it was back then? Or now do you appreciate the whole of the hero of a thousand faces and all that sort of aspect to it? Oh, I have a great appreciation for the, the hero's journey and yes. all that that's embedded in it. I actually write about that in mythology on my own blog. So it's something that I think draws everybody into mm -hmm. it. Real quickly, has your appreciation changed over the years? Yeah, yeah, it definitely has. Uh, 
when I was young and, and through much of my life, the, the big draw for me was the aliens, the monsters, and the robots. <laughs> I loved the cantina scene and uh, sure. Jabba's palace. But a, as I uh, write about Star Wars, this, this is my uh, third published book about Star Wars, I'm going back and analyzing it and, and getting a deeper uh, understanding and a deeper love for what George Lucas was trying to do. Well, congratulations to both of you. It's a great publication. It's certainly substantial. And uh, good luck on the new film, too. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. And that is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.